Welcome to the Pat White Show. Let's get into it. This is Sparta! You know, sometimes in the media, things are very, very difficult to report, and this report just came out today from London, and uh, it involves the royal family, Princess Kate, and we just got the video on this, and I thought uh, I would play this so you would have a chance to hear exactly what she has to say and take a listen to this. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time it has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. Well, there you have it. Kate Middleton, Princess in England, announcing that she has cancer. We don't know what kind, we don't know what type, we don't know where it stands. She indicated she's getting chemotherapy. We'll be undergoing that and we're requesting privacy during that time. And frankly, I think she deserves it. Look, we all know people who've suffered from cancer. We've all known people who've been diagnosed with it. I mean, right here in the city of Fort Wayne, for crying out loud, Mayor of Fort Wayne announced he has it. Killed his wife, unfortunately. And it's taken so many lives of so many people. Probably someone in your family. I know definitely someone in my family. So Kate Middleton announces that she has cancer after major abdominal surgery. I don't know what it was about. I don't think anybody does. How long this is going to take and what she's going to have to go through, we can't fathom. But it's something that we all exist with in our lives. It's a difficult story to, to talk about. Plain all every day, difficult. But now you know what's going on. And hopefully. Better news will arrive soon. Just wanted to pass it along. Thanks for watching. See ya. Coming up next. Well, today, since I am venting about things, I might as well get this off my chest because it's something that's been bothering me for a while. You know, back in the uh, 60s, when I went to college, I was a journalism major, photojournalism to be exact. I was also a broadcast TV major, kind of had two different majors. But in my journalism training, I trained under a guy named John Judy Middaw. He was the chairman of our department, and he had a philosophy. When you wrote an article, you handed it to him because he actually taught back in those days, and he graded his own papers. And if ever you wrote something, if you wrote something that he would take a big red line through it, and he would say, opinion. And he would always tell us in class, journalism is who, what, where, 
why and how. Who, what, where, why, and how. He said, there's no O there. There's no opinion in journalism. And that's the way I was trained, and that's what I believe is what you're supposed to do in journalism. You tell people, here's the who, what, where, why, and how. You don't put your own personal opinion in it in any piece you write. Now, if you do, your piece belongs on the opinion page of the publication or whatever it is you happen to be doing. If you got an opinion, it goes on to the opinion section. This is why newspapers have opinion sections and magazines do, and they plainly, you know, demarket. This is the opinion section. But that's not happening today. Today, people in the media are telling you their opinion as part of a news story. And I can see it in every story that I read. They'll see something that's going, no, there's an opinion right there. He's put an opinion or she's put an opinion in there. Not factual. It's just a personal aside they want to toss in. That's not the way the uh, freedom of the press was supposed to be. That's not the way it was ever designed to be. The freedom of the press was designed to be the fifth estate to cover all the things going on and to keep everybody on the straight and narrow. So if the media was wrong or the media sees something wrong, it's the media's responsibility to report it, whether it's left side or right side, conservative, liberal, whatever. Keep everybody on the straight and narrow in the straight path. That's why the press has so many different carve-outs, if you will, that they're allowed to do, keeping your sources secret and those kind of things, because it was designed to keep everybody honest. Well, that's not what's happened in today's media. Today, the media takes sides. I don't know when that happened, and all I remember when I was in college, we had a young man who was a high radical, I mean, just blatant radical, and uh, he's kind of got thrown out of our journalism department because what he was doing was he was putting his opinion into things. Well, he ended up leaving the journalism department and went across the highway and the street through our campus, and he went over to the Department of Education and measured in education. Years later, it turns out he's a professor at the same college I went to, a professor, a radical. And I think that's what's happened in our colleges and universities. Those radicals of the 60s and 70s and what have you, Either they or their children, who are radicals, are now running those departments and don't go by the, uh, the, the concept of who, what, where, when, why, how that I was taught. They're putting in the O, opinion. And now journalism has taken sides. It's no more being down the center of the road, being the fifth estate, keeping an eye on everything, making sure the left and the right all are on the straight and narrow. They've gone to the left. That's my opinion. That's what I've seen. That's why I don't really count on myself as a card-carrying Republican. I'm more of a card-carrying independent. I hate to admit that because, believe it or not, I've actually helped Democrats get elected in my time. Yes, I have. Because I thought that person was the best person for the job. I don't look at the party. I look at who's the best that I think will do the best job for this my community, my state, my country. I look for the best. But now it has turned into a tribal warfare, in my opinion. And the media has become part of one tribe. And that, folks, is very dangerous when you think about it. Now, these are just my opinions, but now you know how I feel. And now you've had your education in Journalism 101 and the world according to me. Now you know. See ya. Coming up next. Well, it looks like I'm about to delve into international politics, and uh, frankly, it's been something I've been watching for a number of years because I first started studying this back when I was in officer's training school back in 1970 when I wrote on the Arab-Israeli War. This mess has been going on between Israel and the Arabs for, what, centuries? Well, now we have a situation last October when Hamas, Hamas is an organization. Hamas is a group of people that has said death to Israel from the uh, river to the sea. They want to destroy, completely annihilate, and remove from the face of the planet Earth the Jewish tribe. Is there tribal warfare, folks? It's been going on forever. 
Well, so they came across the border into Israel from, from Gaza, and in one day, murdered 1,200 Israelis in cold blood. Machine guns, mowed them down. There were, there were people at a concert. They were just there cutting them down like with a machine gun, like they're at an arcade. Took 250 prisoners, some of whom were American citizens. And that war has been raging since last October, and it's still going on. Now, Bibi Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, said, yep, we're going to do it once and for all. We're going to take these people out. The only way you can win a war is you kill enough of them to make them surrender. And Bibi said, hey, you give us the hostages back, you lay down your arms, you surrender, war's over. Simple as that. And that's the way wars work. That's what happened in World War II. We told the Japanese, hey, we'll kill enough of you. We got a big bomb. You want that bomb to hit Tokyo? No. Kill enough of them, they're going to surrender and give everything up. That's what happened in World War II. Bibi Netanyahu says, we're going to take out Hamas. Now, yes, you've got Gaza. You've got all the Palestinians living in Gaza because that's where they've been placed. Nobody wants them, by the way, in the Arab world. I mean, nobody. Ask Egypt. They don't want them. Nobody wants them because they're a tribe. Everything in, everything in the Middle East is tribes. So what's happened is, is that Israel is going in there and doing the best to uh, get the people out as best they can. But remember, Hamas wants to keep many of these people hostages. They don't want to let them loose because that's their life insurance policy. They can use that as part of the uh, public discussion so the world can turn on the Israelis and be in favor of the Palestinians and say, oh, those poor Palestinians. No, it's Hamas. Hamas are controlling them. Hamas are holding them hostage. And Hamas, and remember, what we have learned is Hamas built an entire city underground, over 300 miles of tunnels under the Gaza Strip, 300 miles. They had complete factories underground manufacturing weapons of war. And, I mean, big enough you could drive cars into. These are factories. And now the Israelis are steadily taking out all those things because they're located under houses, schools, hospitals. We found out they're under hospitals. And then a UN group, for crying out loud, that was supposed to be helping out the Israelis. Turns out they're part of Hamas, we discovered. Anybody get fired from that? Yeah, they said some people got fired. But beyond that, anything else? No, it just goes on. It's turned out into one tribe against another tribe. Now, Israel's pushing everything south, and then, of course, you have the AOCs in Congress, and I say, oh, my God, the Palestinians, you can't do this, you're starving them. Israel's doing the best they can. You know, the United States is doing uh, drops of, uh, of aid. Trucks are moving into those areas, carrying aid. You want to know where the aid is going? For, to Hamas. They're starving the Palestinians because they don't care. They don't care one iota. Hamas wants to take out Israel, destroy it, and every last Jewish person in that particular country. And Israel said, nope, we're going to kill you first, and they mean it. Now, are they going to have to attack southern, uh, southern Gaza, the city down there, to finally get Hamas? Because that's where Hamas is gone. They've got no other place to go. Israel has steadily pushed them south. And the last place is the southern part of Gaza. And they've got them cornered. Now, is this going to be a giant uh, us against them? Is it uh, the Palestinians or the uh, Hamas against Israel? No, it's Hamas against Israel in the opinion of life. World opinion. Oh, we're supporting the Palestinians. It's shame on the Israelis. So says AOC. So says Chuck Schumer. Schumer's telling uh, Israel, hey, get a different government. Ain't none of his damn business. So here's the deal. They got to do what they got to do. And they're going to do it once and for all because if you cause a ceasefire, Hamas is just going to rebuild and do it all over again because that's what they do. Until you kill the head of the snake, the snake will continue to survive. Now, what, what they do, they got to do. They're doing the best to clear things out and save save the Palestinians, and get them out of the country in the safest way possible. We're running aid in there, but the aid we're sending in is being given to Hamas. They've got the guns. The Palestinians don't. That's what we're dealing with, folks. Whether you like it or not, 
It's one tribe against the other. And what's sad is, if this mess keeps going on, I think it could boil over here in the United States especially. It goes into August at the Democrat National Convention. Israel versus Hamas, uh, Israel versus the Arabs, Palestinians. Could that be a flashpoint for riots in Chicago? Don't know. 1968, I remember what happened there. Could it happen again? Nobody knows. That's some of my perspective on what's happening involving Israel, Hamas, and the death of thousands of Israelis at the hands of a political group who wants to destroy another tribe. My thoughts are mine. Your thoughts are yours. Let's just wait and see what happens. That's all I got. See ya. Coming up next. Well, unless you've been living under a rock, I presume you know that most all of the drug traffic that is coming into the United States, the majority of it, I'm not saying all of it, but the majority of it is coming from Mexico has been for years. Everybody knows it. Well, now the president of Mexico, President Obrador, said, hey, we aren't going to be fighting the cartels. We have a Mexico first policy. We're going to take care of our own. And after all, the the cartel people, they're human beings. We are not going to do the United States job of, of trying to shut down the cartels and get rid of them. We're only concerned about Mexico. And as far as the drug problem goes, hey, gringos, that's your problem, not ours. Yes, we're going to ask the Catholic Church to see if they can mediate between the gangs to get them to come to peace. But the truth is, the Mexican government is not going to interfere with the cartels. And there's a reason. The cartels control the Mexican government. Obrador knows good and well. If he goes down and says, we're going to go take on our, our, our military, he's going to take on the cartels, he's going to get killed. And anybody else that tries to stop the cartels is going to see the same fate. The cartels control Mexico. The cartels fight among themselves for power. The cartels fight among themselves for dominance, to be able to deliver drugs to the people of the United States who want drugs. And yes, drugs are a problem in the United States because we have people who want them for reasons that I cannot I cannot explain, I don't know. But he's partly right. The drug problem in the United States is our problem. We got people who want to do drugs, and the cartels are providing it. Now, this fentanyl thing has come up, and it's killing a lot of people. But they're still smuggling into the United States. It's still coming in. And the president of, uh, of Mexico, Obrador, says, nah, we're doing Mexico first policy. We're going to take care of our own people. We're not going to tell the U.S. The U.S. can't tell us to take out the drug cartels. We ain't doing it. Now you're saying, well, okay, you don't want to do it. We'll send a lead to military forces into Mexico. Uh, you start traipsing on somebody else's territory on their ground, and you're getting yourself into an international situation which may not be good. Let's be honest. Uh, Do things happen on the down low? Yes, they do. But if you come out and say, hey, we're sending over the 5th Infantry or whatever it is into Mexico, mm -mm, you got some big problems internationally, nationally, and everywhere else. One country invading another because they don't like what they're doing? Hey, The Mexican government is on the take from the cartels. The Mexican government knows if they force the cartels to end their cheap cheap and evil, dirty deeds, they're going to kill the people of the government. That's the way they work. You may not like it, but I don't know of a better way to handle this thing. Because now even the president of Mexico said, eh, we're not going to touch the cartels. After all, They provide jobs for people. They provide income for poor people. They can earn money running the drugs. Hey, we got to make sure that our people have jobs. It's poverty. It's the way it is in Mexico. Whatever it takes, apparently, is what they're saying. And right now, they're saying, we're not going to mess with the cartels. Now you know a little something you didn't know before. That's all I got. See ya. Coming up next.
Well, let's talk a little bit about immigration. And, uh, you know, you probably heard about all the stuff going on. Supreme Court saying that Texas uh, has a right to control their borders. And then the, the Court of Appeals taking it up and saying, no, you can't. No, you don't. Been a big fight going on about uh, deporting people coming over the border illegally. It's a problem that we have in the United States, and millions have literally come across our border in the last three years. Well, now the president of Mexico, President Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador, they have long names in Mexico, he has criticized the Texas law. And let me tell you what he said. Now, you're going to love this part. He said, hey, you try to deport anybody back to Mexico who illegally comes into your country, we're going to send them back to the United States. We are not going to allow you to deport into Mexico our citizens who left Mexico and came into the United States illegally. Yep, I'm not kidding you. That's exactly what he said. He said, and I'm going to quote him. He said, let me say this once and for all. We will not accept deportations from the Texan government. We will not. He said, we oppose this draconian law. It is completely contrary to human rights, completely uh, dehumanizing, anti-Christian, unjust. It violates the terms of human existence, coexistence, I'm sorry, and not only international law as well, but even violates the Bible, he said. I don't remember reading that in the Bible, but hey, apparently he reads stuff I don't read. But he said, you try to deport Mexicans who jump into the United States illegally, and you try to send them back. And he said, no, we're going to send them back to the U.S. We aren't going to allow you to do that. Well, this is the world in which we live, folks. This is how society is going. Now you have the president of Mexico saying, hey, illegals coming into Mexico, you try to deport them and send them back. I don't care who it is. New president comes in. We ain't taking them back. We're going to send them back to the United States. What are you going to do? Nicaragua, well, I take it back, Venezuela. Venezuela will not allow Venezuelans to come into the United States illegally. They will not take them back. They don't want them. Many of them came from Venezuelan prisons. So Venezuela, you got Venezuelans, where are you going to put them? Because Venezuela won't take them back. And now the president of Mexico said, you try to deport Mexicans that uh, came into your United States, we ain't taking them back, and we're going to send them back to the United States. We're going to help them. We're going to usher them in. Hey, here you go, guys. Go back to the United States. Send money back to us, okay? That's what's going on, folks. Welcome to the world. And you wonder why things are going to heck in a handbasket? If this isn't one of the things to tell you that, nothing else will. It's becoming an ugly world out there, folks, and I'm not sure how badly this is going to end, but it ain't going to be pretty. My thoughts. Talk among yourselves. See ya. Coming up next. Well, what do you say we discuss a little bit more about history today? And we're going to be talking about what is known as the State of the Union speech. Now, as you know, recently, the president gave a State of the Union speech, which I said was fiery, was uh, loud, boisterous, and but I didn't talk about all the things that were in it. And one thing I want to talk about is something he plans to utilize to spend your money, taxpayer money. And this is only for taxpayers. So if you don't pay taxes, this probably doesn't affect you. But if you do pay taxes, you might want to listen to how he plans to divvy up your money. Okay? Here's what the plan is. What he wants to do is to give people, give them a $400 a month payment. Works out to be a tax credit of about $10,000. $400 a month so they can buy themselves a house. Now, I don't know about you, but when I went to buy a house, nobody was giving me money. Uh, it's taxpayers' money. Any money that I used to buy a house was my money. But now the president wants to give your taxpayer dollars so people can buy their first house. He says, well, this is young folks trying to get in the house. And also involving 
people who sell their first, their starter home, let's say they got a first home, they want to sell it and get a second home, and he wants to give them that also so they'd be inclined to sell their starter home to someone who wants to buy their starter home, giving them $400 a month for two years to cover the cost of what would be a mortgage that probably is somewhere in the range of seven, seven and a quarter percent. He's saying, well, people can't afford to get into houses and we got to help them out. Give them $400 a month to lower their effective interest rate about eh, 1.5%. So say it takes down to seven and a quarter, down to around, uh, around 6%, somewhere in there. And using your taxpayer money. This is what he said in the State of Union speech. I don't know if you were paying attention to it or not, but that's exactly what he said he wants to do. Now, something else he wants to do is to lower the closing cost of a mortgage. There's a thing called title insurance. And he wants to, uh, wants to call for the end of title insurance to save people roughly anywhere about $1,500, somewhere in that area. It depends on the, on the amount you pay. So that's one thing he wants to do with your taxpayer money. And the problem is, is this going to increase the number of people buying houses? Nobody knows. Nobody knows for sure. But the idea of taking your taxpayer dollars and saying, hey, I'm going to help somebody else get their first house, what they're doing is trying to buy votes. That's what this is. Plain and simple, just trying to buy votes for the 2024 election. Prey on the young people, offer them free stuff, give them anything to get their vote. That's what this is all about. If you didn't listen to the State of the Union speech, you may have missed it. If you did miss it, now you know what's in there. Free money for people. For doing what? Nothing. Just for their vote. That's what this is all about. Coming up next. Well, hello, everyone. And another episode of today's Pat White Show is happening right now. And let me tell you about a new thing that's going on that maybe, maybe will affect you a little bit if you're a homeowner and um, if you've ever dealt with a realtor. Now, realtors are fine, in my opinion. They got a job to do. And they do, do it pretty doggone well. But there's been a tradition for many years that if you list your house with an agent, you're going to be paying a roughly a 6% amount of that selling price is going to be given or split up between the selling uh, realtor and the buying realtor. So what this has done is created a situation where if you've got a house that say it's $100,000, you're going to pay $6,000 of that $100,000 that you're getting from someone who buys your house. You're going to be giving that to a realtor. If it's, it's uh, $200,000, it's going to be uh, $12,000. $12, the bigger the amount of money your house sells for, the larger amount of payment you're going to be giving out to a realtor or realtors, the buyer's realtor and the seller's realtor, the person who works for you. Well, that's finally ended up in court, and a judgment for $418 million came down that says, hey, can't do that. That's over and done with. And if a judge accepts this particular ruling, what's going to happen is the days of uh, 6% commission is going to be basically dead. Now, have things changed in recent years? Well, yes. The internet has changed virtually everything. Back in the old days, you wanted your house listed on the MLS, which was the, the main stocking point for all the homes that were for sale. And because of that, that's where you had to go. So you end up having to pay the 6% to your, your realtor and to the realtor representing the buyer. So imagine that. They could push you into uh, selling a, a your house for big money or somebody else for buying a house well beyond their means because the uh, realtor representing the buyer is going to get 3% of the 6%. So it's turned into a giant morass, and now the courts have taken a look at it and said, no, you can't do that. Enough's enough. So what's going to happen now is you, if you're selling your home, you're going to be able to negotiate with a realtor. If a realtor wants to list your home, hey, what are you going to give me? What's the best deal you got? Because of the internet out there, people can now look for houses 
online a lot easier than they used to be able to. Every realtor has their own site. Uh, they all market their, their products in, in ways that uh, all you got to do is go online and check out a house. You don't have to go through the MLS or anything else. It's going to result in, frankly, you being able to get a better price, a better negotiated price on what you're going to pay your realtor. I know some firms out in California I've heard about that charge a flat fee of $10,000, regardless of whether your house sells for a million dollars or 500000 or whatever it sells for. That's a flat fee they charge, and they list your house. So, something to think about. Down the road, if the judge accepts this deal, what's going to, you're going to be able to negotiate with your realtor on how much you're going to have to give up at the end of the sale when you have the closing and a check is written out of that money that you could have earned with the escrow and the equity that you had in your home. It's something new. It's something that's just come out. And it's something you should know about because it could save you money, especially if you're using a realtor. That's all I got. See ya. Coming up next. All right, let's talk about something even more interesting. Let's talk about Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Now, I'm sure almost everybody's familiar with Ben and Jerry's ice cream, right? Well, Ben and Jerry's is actually owned by a company called Unilever. And Unilever is an international company, owns about 400 different brands. But they've decided to spin off their ice cream business. Now, that includes names like Ben and Jerry, Breyers, Magnum, Popsicle. I like popsicles. And Klondike. They're like a Klondike bar. And they've been doing this. They, this has taken more than a century to make this decision. They said, well, we want to be a lean, mean investment machine. I don't know. Whatever the heck it is they're doing. But they want to divest themselves of that. And they say it's a growth move to get rid of things like their ice cream division. Well, let me tell you about Ben & Jerry's. Ben & Jerry's was founded back in 1978, and they are known as a left-leaning advocacy and, um, okay, left-leaning, let's be honest. They're a Vermont-based ice cream maker. However, when they were purchased, now this is the thing, I don't know how they did this. When they were purchased, they were able to keep their own independent board of directors. So Unilever wasn't on their board. I don't know how they did that. But so by having their own independent board of directors, they were able to continue with their progressive activism. Uh, even after they were sold to Unilever in the, in the year 2000. Well, in recent years, uh, because of that unique structure with Unilever, Ben and Jerry's have waded into some very controversial issues. And Unilever has basically stayed hands-off. Unilever didn't want to get into it because, well, they, didn't, they got other things to worry about. So the biggest problem was in uh, July of 2021 when uh, Unilever, or when the Ben & Jerry's, rather, announced that they would no longer sell their ice cream to Israelis on the West Bank. That's what I said. Ben and Jerry said we're no longer going to sell our ice cream to Israelis of the West Bank because the uh, Unilever or because uh, Ben and Jerry's called it occupied Palestinian territory. Well, obviously that marked a lot of outrage, as you can imagine, from both sides of the political equation, and um, so Unilever had just sort of distanced itself from Ben and Jerry's and all the political stuff they've been involved with. And uh, they haven't supported any of the things that Ben and Jerry's were supporting. Um, various sanctions and stuff like that that Ben and Jerry's were purporting. And uh, it created a lot, of, a lot of bad problems. So now, solve the problem. Unilever says, yeah, we're getting out of the ice cream business. We're done with this. Ben and Jerry's is going with it. So what's going to happen? Well, right now, uh, Ben and Jerry's uh, was hit with their own boycott last year. Uh, because on Independence Day, they posted on Twitter, which is now called X, and here's what they said on Independence Day last year. Quote, this is the 4th of July. It's high time we recognize 
the U.S. to exist on stolen indigenous land and commit to returning it, unquote. That was from Ben and Jerry's on X. And a lot of states decided to quit uh, investing in Unilever, and they did. Took a lot of money out, and Arizona did, and Florida did, and Illinois did, and New Jersey, and New York, and Texas, and actually, even North Carolina did. So, they're going to see are selling it to somebody else, and they're going to let someone else take over the headache of Ben and Jerry's. But now something you didn't know. Unilever has decided they've had enough of Ben and Jerry's and are selling the entire ice cream line. A little something for you to pass along. See ya. Coming up next. You know, one of the things that uh, people mention, the fact is that I don't talk everything about politics because I never believed that politics was the entire story for everybody to exist on a radio show every single day. I talk about other things that kind of catch my attention and maybe you will catch yours. So I'm going to give you a couple of things here that are different. I'm going to go into the world of sports. That's right. I'm going to talk about sports. Two things in particular. One, happens to be the U.S. Olympics. Well, it's not the U.S. Olympics. It's the World Olympics. Olympics coming to Paris 2024 this summer. Well, in case you didn't know it, the city of Paris has decided that athletes will not get air conditioning who live in the Olympic villages. That's right. No air conditioning. They're going to use water pumped into the buildings from underground to supposedly cool the uh, rooms in which the athletes live, survive, uh, during the Olympics. Now, most people like the temperature of the rooms, you know, in the lower 70s, maybe 68 if it's really bad. And if you've never been to to uh, Paris in the summer, it gets hot. If they, if they get heat like they've had previously, it gets hot and humid. And I'm sure the athletes are going to want to live in cool, comfortable areas. Well, they don't want to affect the climate in Paris. They're, they want, they're worried about their carbon footprint. So they're not going to have traditional air conditioning. They're going to pump water from deep underground, put it in, the, in under the floors of the rooms of the Olympic Village in hopes that that'll cool the, the, uh, the rooms down. Will it? I don't know. But if you're an Olympian, watch for the stories to occur on TV about no air conditioning and the temperature in the athletes' rooms. I guarantee you that's going to be a story during the upcoming Olympics. And speaking of the upcoming Olympics, another story, the Russians are not going to be allowed in the opening parade. That's right. Russians are not going to have a sign up there going, USSR, Russia, Soviet Union, whatever, and have all their athletes come parading out when they do the little parade interest thing. It's a big thing they showed on TV. Well, Russia has been castigated because they attacked Ukraine. So the International Olympic Committee said, "Mm -mm, no way, Jose, Uh, we're not going to allow you to uh, march in the opening, uh, opening day parade. Independent, independent athletes only, uh, no big sign, none of that. Well, obviously, the Russians are very incensed over this, say it's not right, it violates Olympic tradition, yada, 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 yada. So, watching TV, if you plan to watch the opening of the Olympic Games when you're waiting for the uh, Russian team to come out, well, you ain't going to see the Russian team. So, another thing you're going to see on TV, the commentator's talking about, Gee, Russia is not being allowed to parade in the opening part of the event. I don't know about the closing, but in the opening, no, they're not allowed to be in there. Okay, so there you got two stories about the Olympics. How about one here in the good old U.S. of A? Can we talk football? I'm going to talk football. Because, as you know, conferences are rapidly changing in the, uh, in the, in the current situation in America. You got this football conference, that football conference. We used to have the big five and all these different conferences. 
they're starting to combine themselves because they're looking for big money, programming money from the TV networks. So you're going to have all these various schools joining other conferences, have bigger and bigger conferences to uh, get the big money from the networks. That's what it's all about, folks. It's about big money. So, turns out, about the two biggest conferences you're going to have now, when everything plays itself out, is going to be the Big Ten, which is now the big, what, 20? Something like that. And, of course, the SEC, Southeastern Conference. Now, that means other conferences are probably going to die and fade away, right? Say, like the, uh, oh, the Pac-10? Who's now what? The Pac Zero? Pac Two? Don't know. And of course, the uh, ACC, the uh, Atlantic Coastal Conference. Well, it turns out you got some other teams you're looking at in some of these other conferences, like Florida State, Clemson, big names. But the SEC and the Big Ten are only interested in one particular team they want in their conference. You know who it is? North Carolina State. North Carolina State is the team that both the Big Ten, which is now the Big 20, Big 25, whatever they are, and the SEC. That's the one they're both fighting for. Who will win? I do not know. But how is it going to work itself out? Folks, that's anybody's guess. It just depends on who offers them the most money, the biggest deal, and the biggest cut of the TV money that's coming from the national, the, uh, national uh, broadcasting companies. Because I'll tell you what, if you wonder why your cable TV bill goes up so much, most of it is because of having to pay for the sports coverage of the football teams and the conferences. That's what you have to know about. So now, we have talked about the Olympics. We've talked about college football. And none of it had to deal with politics. See? I'm not your same old everyday radio talk show host. No, I'm different, and I know it. That's all I got. See ya. Coming up next. All right, it's time to talk about another, uh, I hate to say it, folks, but another political situation. But this one involves your taxes, the money that you and I turn into the federal government every year and try to figure out what they're doing with it. Well, now I got one for you, and if this doesn't uh, get in your craw a little bit, apparently you don't care. But here's the deal. The U.S. Department of Education just published a state-by-state -state list of people who borrowed money for their education and who have their loan forgiven. Remember, this is a thing that, the, uh, that Biden was trying to do to get rid of uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, actually billions of dollars, worth of student loans. And people had built these student loans up and um, really didn't want to pay them back. And many of them got degrees that frankly mean nothing in the today's world. And so they didn't want to pay the loans back. And a lot of people were delinquent on them and didn't pay them back. So Biden, looking for a way to win votes, to get people to vote for him, especially younger people, he said, hey, I'm going to dismiss, I'm going to just declare all these student loans null and void. And that way, people who have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of student loans get a free pass. That's right. They, don't, they get the education, didn't get anything out of it, but they get the education and they get it for free, compliments of the United States taxpayer, you and me. Well, the Supreme Court took it on and said, nah, mm -mm, no can do. That's... That's against the rules. You can't uh, make an executive action and dismiss all these loans. That must be done through Congress. Well, obviously, Congress ain't going to do it. So what Biden did was he said, okay, I'm going to change the rules for repaying the loans. 
So there's set guidelines for paying the paying the things. You do this for a certain amount of time, and you pay a certain amount of stuff. He redid the rules, and it's under a thing called the Saving on a Valuable Valuable Education Plan. S A V E is that's the uh, acronym. Well, Education Department just released and said, who has thus far had one point two billion dollars of loans written off and given to the regular taxpayer who aren't going to, it's going to come out of the taxpayer. You and me, we're going to pay for it. So who got the uh, loans uh, negated? Let's take a look state by state because we got the top states. Number one state, Texas. 14,510 borrowers. And, but here's Texas. Okay, Texas is a, uh, is a currently a red state. Actually, it's poor, a little more red and blue. Uh, it's, it's moving. They're trying to get Texas to turn into a blue state. And with all the people moving there from the illegals, I wouldn't be surprised that's going to happen. So they were the leader. Followed by California. Who knew? California, 13,580 people had their loans dismissed. Then Florida. 12,790, followed by New York, Ohio, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, oh, I ain't done yet, Illinois, and New Jersey. Now, what do all of those states, California, New York, Ohio, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and New Jersey all have in common? They're blue states. Yep, that's right. Blue states. Joe wants to hold on to the vote from those people in those states, figuring, hey, he's got to have those states to win re-election in 2024. But $1.2 billion, and the administration is crowing about it. Look what we're doing for people who aren't paying back the loans they took out. Did you take out a loan? You pay it back. Now, I didn't take out any loans when I was in college. I worked my way through college, paid for everything along the way, and uh, got out of college with owing nobody nothing. I earned my way, and I had a scholarship too, by the way. So, just want to cover that up just so people would say, Oh, how'd you get through college? Okay, yes, I was scholarship, and yes, I paid my own way. Those two things took care of myself. Now, so here are all these students in these blue states getting their loans dismissed. Don't you just love how voting, how traditional politics works in America? Yeah, we're talking about making sausage, right? Nope. We're talking about getting votes in 2024. Now you see where your taxpayer money is going. Now, if that doesn't bother you, you have ice water running through your veins, or you're a Democrat. Either way. All right, that's all I got for now. See ya. Coming up next. Well, what do you say, rather than talking about politics or the world, we discuss entertainment, the music world, things that you like, you know, like music. So let's talk about a little thing that happened uh, about a week ago in Toledo, Ohio. John Cougar Mellencamp, now many of you know who he is, he's been around a long time, Indiana lad, he was at a concert, and something happened at the concert that apparently made him a little bit upset. So here's a guy, 72 years old, out playing the concert uh, in front of a whole bunch of old people, because the only ones who attend his concerts nowadays are people my age, who are old folks, and... He was there on this St. Patrick's Day, and one of the members of the audience, because what 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 Coop does, aside from playing music, he interjects uh, pictures and tells stories about things in his family. It, it's almost like a dialogue. Okay, if you've been to one of his concerts, shows pictures of things, talked about his 99-year-old grandmother, and, and he just tells stories. Well, somebody in the audience, and I have no idea who it was, stood up and said, hey! 
Shut up and sing. Well, you know, that's a pretty standard thing when you get the people who attend the concert spending their 401k money so their kids don't get it. They want to see a concert and want to see somebody sing. Because that's why they're going to the concert. Well, the Coog apparently didn't appreciate that. And he started to sing, you know, picked up his guitar and started to sing Jack and Diane. Got a couple of chords into it. And he abruptly told the crowd to, uh, well, do something to themselves you really can't do anatomically. And he said the show was done. Walked off the stage. I mean, he walked off the stage. People paid their concert money and everything else. He told them what to do with themselves and walked off the stage. Well, apparently the accordion player and the uh, violin player walked off with him. And then later on, a few minutes later, the accordion player and the uh, the violinist, fiddle player, if you will, came back up on stage and the fiddle player goes, uh, uh, she puts her fingers to her lips, going, shh, mm -mm, don't say anything. Coop comes back out, obviously looking a little bit unhappy, comes back out and uh, uh, starts to sing again. And... Um, but when he came back out on stage, he was smoking a cigarette, strapped on his Telecaster, and uh, launched into a thing called Rain on the Scarecrow with no further mention. So apparently these people went backstage and said, John, hey, man, you can't do this. There are people who paid a lot of money for this concert, and they want you to come out and sing because you're a singer. That's who you are. Well, for whatever reason, someone talked a little sense into John came back out and finished up his concert. But is there a lesson to be learned there? Well, if uh, you roll into town and you think you're going to sit there telling stories to people and showing pictures, and someone in the audience yells, shut up and sing, that's what they want you to do. They're paying the money, John, not you paying them. They're entitled to what they paid for. Let that be a reminder to all you rock and rollers out there who plan to go out and earn some more money off John Q. Public. Just saying. That's my thoughts. See ya. Coming up next. Hello, everyone. Well, what do you say we talk about safety, namely your safety? Because as we know, an eclipse is coming to this area, and it'll happen on April the 8th, which is next month. Now, the concern here is this, and this is from the Indiana State Police. You know, there's people driving everywhere around trying to get into the spot so they can see the perfect point of the eclipse. Now, Fort Wayne, we're not going to be in the perfect center for that corona thing, the diamond style they're looking for. We're going to be very close to the uh, close to that, but not not pure in the center. But some people will be driving from from uh, southwest to northeast, following the eclipse. Now, two things to think about: one, if you're a private pilot, do not. And this is from the FAA: do not decide to go out flying on April the eighth, so you can watch the eclipse flying in your little airplane. Don't do it. The uh, FAA and the uh, the folks who run the airplanes are saying this is the most dangerous thing you can do. So don't do it. Second thing again from the Indiana State Police. Do not drive during that 3 to 3.15 time period. Then the ellipse, eclipse is going to hit us here in uh, northeastern Indiana. Stay off of the roads. And here's the reason. Uh, you could be uh, driving in your car kind of look it up, try to see the sun, go off the road and hit somebody. And by the way, for you pedestrians who want to stand by the side of the road to watch the eclipse, because you're saying, well, time for the eclipse. Let's get it out of the car, honey. Let's go stand here and watch the eclipse. Don't do that. Because some fool could be driving around, not paying attention, lose control of his car, and hit you standing by the side of the road. Simple safety things. Just the folks from the Indiana State Police and the Federal Aviation Administration are trying to convince you not to be outside if you don't have to be. And don't stand by the roads and don't fly an airplane. Pretty simple stuff. 
for April the 8th. And you better hope it's clear and sunny, because if it's cloudy and rainy, eh, ain't going to be a very good day. Just saying. That's all I want to tell you about. Just be safe out there, folks. You have been advised. Don't do anything stupid. See ya. Coming up next, NCAA basketball time, and you're probably one of those people that has decided, well, I'm going to get a bracket. I'm going to put some money in and see if I can't win the whole big pot at the end of the rainbow. There's big national ones. There's all sorts of ones that people can enter. But did you ever wonder what your odds are of actually winning? Well, apparently the NCAA has compiled the data over the last five years, and your chances of winning the entire Godzilla, you know, going straight through and winning all the all the games, works out to one in one hundred and twenty point two billion. One in one hundred and twenty point two billion. Those are your odds of winning your bracketology. Now you're saying to yourself, "Well, fine." Uh, but, you know, there's other things I can do also. Well, fine. How about, uh, oh, how often could you uh, win a hole-in-one for you golfers out there? I think that's one in 1,250. Hmm, one in 1,250 versus one in 120 billion? Got a better chance of, uh, of uh, hitting a hole-in-one on the golf course. Or maybe getting hit by lightning. Or... Dare I say it? Oh, have a shark bite you. Those numbers are actually better than winning the NCAA basketball bracket. And yet, who goes for it? Almost all of us. Now, I, I am not one who, who's into this because I've seen something kind of interesting. You've seen a situation where a number one team plays like 15 teams. You know, that's how they do it. You know, top versus bottom, top versus bottom. That's the way they set it out. And how many times have we seen a number 15 team knock off a number one team? Anybody know any teams in the area that have that? Had that happened to them? Just saying. Like I said, you got a better chance of hitting a hole in one, better chance of being bitten by a shark, you know, better chance of, well, who else you can think of? So basketball is a wonderful concept. We all have fun. We go out there and, and we just do everything we can to pick, oh, this team over this team and this team over that team. But the truth is, you're going to lose. And if you get close, you get close and it makes you feel better. But with odds of 1 in 120.2 billion to 1, you've got a snowball's chance of winning. But if you're going to play, Go ahead and play. Have a little fun, waste a little money, and do a little dream with me. That's what happens when you bet on the NCAA championship brackets. Go forth and play. But don't blame me if you lose. You know the odds. See ya. Coming up next. You know, people buy things. People buy expensive things, and people buy things that, frankly, many times I don't think they need. But I've just seen a couple of things advertised, and I went, really? People are going to spend that amount of money to buy stuff. Well, I want you to take a look and see a couple of things that I saw. Here's one, the latest one. You see it right there on the screen. It's a beer-making machine. That's right, a beer-making machine. You add all the ingredients, you seal it up, and for about $700, you can make your own beer for consumption. Now, I'm thinking, okay, what's a six-pack of beer cost you? Uh, you know, six bucks, ten bucks? Well, I don't know. I don't buy beer because I don't drink beer. But $700 to make yourself some beer? Sorry. How much beer do you have to buy to offset that $700? And that's just for the container. That's just the container. And you got all, all the makings, you got to buy all that. Here's the stuff you got to buy. See, there you go. There's the stuff you got to buy the kits to make the beer. So there's a container right there. $700 just to make your own beer at home. Sorry, but I think I can go to the liquor store or the grocery store. And if I want beer, I can get some of that there and not pay $700 because I don't want something that I personally brewed. And frankly, I saw a guy on TV years ago. 
Uh, Alton, I think Al Alton Brown, whatever his name is, make his own beer in a bathtub with bottles. And I don't think he spent more than about 20 bucks to buy all this stuff to make his own beer. So where are you going spending $700? We can do it for 20 bucks or whatever it is. I don't know. That's one thing that had me uh, frosted. I'm just, I went 700 bucks. And then, oh, wait a minute, I ain't done yet. Then here's another item. Yes, take a look at this. A toaster. To toast your, your bread, toast your bagel, toast whatever it is you toast, your Pop-Tart, $400. $400 for a toaster? I don't think my toaster cost me 20 bucks, maybe, if that. But it's a fancy one. Why, it's digital. You push the little buttons. You, you uh, set up everything exactly the way you want, to the, down to the, uh, the nth toasting on it. I don't know. But am I going to spend $400 for a toaster and $700 to brew beer? No, I don't think so. Now, unless, of course, I'm a single person earning $80,000 a year or a married couple earning $400,000 or $200,000 a year. Yeah, then I can splurge on whatever the heck I want, and maybe that's some of the stuff that I would get. But I'm living pretty comfortably right now at what I do and what I earn, and I don't need a $700 beer-making machine or a $400 toaster. That's just me. I don't know how you're thinking about it, but I don't think you really need that. And for those who do, man, you're living in a different life than I am. My thoughts. See ya. Well, that does it for today's edition of the Pat White Show. Thanks for tuning in, and make sure to follow us on social media for the latest Pat White Show. For all the news and updates, and stay tuned for brand new episodes of the Pat White Show coming real soon. Like what you're hearing? Make sure you don't miss an episode by following the Pat White Show on Spotify. Just search for The Pat White Show, hit follow, and get ready for insightful conversations delivered straight to your Spotify feed. If you enjoy watching podcasts as much as listening to them, good news! The Pat White Show is also on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel now for visual content, behind-the-scenes footage, and full podcast experience. Find us on YouTube at The Pat White Show channel. 